Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back to more Conversations in the Digital Age. Our focus today is on Latin America and the challenges the new administration will face in the region. Recently, we have seen signs of progress in Colombia, Argentina, and Peru, while Venezuela and Brazil are in political upheaval. Mexican policy is also in play. In the first of the presidential debates, Donald Trump continuing his hard line toward Mexico maintained that we are losing jobs to Mexico and that the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, should be renegotiated. Is there anything to this? Where is U.S. policy headed with our good neighbor in Latin America? Here to help us answer these questions is Shannon O'Neill. Shannon O'Neill is a senior fellow in Latin American Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations and is the author of the best-selling book, Two Nations Indivisible, Mexico, the United States, and the Road Ahead. Shannon, welcome back to the program. So nice to be here. Shannon, from the early 20th century, the United States has enjoyed a good neighbor policy toward Latin America. Now it seems to be a politics of antagonism. What do you think has happened? Well, over the last century plus, we've seen ups and downs in U.S.-Latin American relations with particular countries and with the region more generally. We've had times where we've had close relationships, where we've seen, seen bonds between the two, for instance, in the 1960s with the Alliance for Progress. And then we've also seen times when we've had real tensions with the region, and particularly U.S. policy towards Cuba, which has somehow spilled over in many years to the rest of the region, a suspicion about U.S. intentions in the region. But we have not seen, in recent years at least, this real antagonism that we did see during the electoral campaign in a position of a U.S. candidate for president um, that was so antagonistic toward the region. Well, let's uh, start with Mexico, because that seems to be front and center. Uh, and, of course, it's the closest Latin American neighbor. Uh, what is the state of uh, U.S.-Mexico relations? You know, overall, U.S.-Mexico relations have been quite good. And we've seen over the last decade several things that have promoted the deepening of these ties. One is in continued economic integration between the two countries. And so based on NAFTA and building off of that, we have seen trade expand four plus fold between the two countries. And really, it's not just the quantity of trade, which is near a, tri near a half trillion dollars every year. It's what is traded. And so today, when you look at what goes back and forth between Mexico, it's not necessarily finished goods. It's not a final product. It's actually pieces and parts that are moving back and forth in the making of things, in the making of cars, in the making of airplanes, in the making of flat screen TVs, and a whole host of other things that supports factories and jobs on both sides of the border. So it's a very different trading relationship the United States has with Mexico than almost any other country in the world, and particularly compared to countries such as China or Brazil or even the European Union. Well, uh, NAFTA was negotiated in the Bill Clinton administration, uh, and uh, uh, Trump in the campaign argued that uh, we really uh, should uh, tear up the treaty, uh, that it's bad for the United States, that we lose jobs. Uh, that uh, our goods uh, uh, are charged a tariff uh, when we sell them into Mexico, but their goods aren't charged a tariff. I mean, is, what are the facts on this? The whole point of NAFTA in many ways was to reduce tariffs, to get rid of tariffs between the two countries, and that NAFTA did do. It was also to create a legal system or a legal basis for trade back and forth or investment between the two countries that would allow companies on either side to use uh, a more um, neutral law, um, basically U.S. law, but a NAFTA-based law um, if there were disputes. So to really to provide certainty to investors who might go into Mexico or Mexican investors who might come into the United States. And there have been tens of billions of dollars of Mexican investment that's come into the United States, even as we've seen a lot of U.S. investment go down there. So tariffs were actually gotten rid of. And when Trump was referring to tariffs, I think what he really meant was that Mexico charges a sales tax, a VAT tax, which is something we in the United States charge too. That has nothing to do with imports and exports. That just has to do with general revenue raising. I mean, Mexico charges uh, the VAT even to domestically produce goods. It charges it on everything except for a few essentials. Some food and medicine are exempt. But otherwise, clothing, everything else is charged a VAT, just the way we would charge sales taxes in our stores. And when they... Uh, 
uh, export goods to us, uh, our various states charge uh, sales taxes and hidden taxes, uh, the same taxes that they impose on, on all the sales within uh, the state. Isn't that right? Exactly. If you go and buy a TV that's coming from Mexico, you will pay a sales tax on that, just as if you bought a TV made in the U.S. in Mexico, you would pay this VAT tax. Now, what about the claim that we're losing jobs to uh, Mexico, that uh, Ford is uh, closing its plants and uh, that uh, they're going to uh, lay off all the workers and instead hire Mexican workers to produce small cars in Mexico? And what are the facts on that? One of the biggest global trends for the last 30 years has been the development of what economists call global supply chains. And really what that means is that production no longer happens in one country. It happens across countries. And so as that has happened around the world, Mexico has been part of that. And NAFTA has helped expand that uh, ability of companies to produce in various places. But what's really interesting here is when we think about the movement of jobs and the opening of factories elsewhere, the place where most of this is happening <clears throat> is in China. Um, and we've seen the rise of China over the last 15, 16 years since it joined the WTO, the World Trade Organization. And with China, we do not have a free trade agreement. And what's interesting about NAFTA, actually, is as the U.S. looks to compete globally, as it looks to enter into these global supply chains and make products that are competitive to sell globally, it needs regional partners. We've seen these regional hubs come together as people make things. So in many ways, for instance, we have a car industry here in the United States today precisely because there's manufacturing on both sides of the border, in fact, also in Canada. So it's this regional production that allows Ford and GM and other car companies to remain competitive and to sell around the world. So in many ways, NAFTA has actually helped promote the staying of American jobs rather than going to other regions with whom we do not have free trade agreements, and particularly there, it's China. I think Ford um, was quick to point out uh, that uh, they have uh, not laid off a single U.S. worker as a result of their uh, building small cars in Mexico. They have 8,000 employees in Mexico, 80,000 in the United States. Yeah, and as Ford has expanded its operations in Mexico, it's been able to expand its operations and its employment here in the United States. So in that particular case, it's been a win-win on both sides of the border. Uh, carrier air conditioning, what are the facts there? I mean, there too you see a closing of a plant in the Midwest and some moving down to Mexico. But you also see other cases where because of operations in Mexico, you've seen plants expand in the U.S. And in fact, I was down in Mexico and visited a plant down there of uh, a company that's a Michigan-based company that builds the rods that go into your sunroof. And so they do sunroofs for all types of, of, of cars, all kinds of, of brands. And they were telling me that by opening this plant that's down in Mexico near Guanajuato, town in Mexico, they were able to keep their plant in Michigan and actually open another plant in Michigan because they were able to provide their rods to many more suppliers given where the location is. So there is an integration again. It's this platform of production that's happening. No one makes cars anymore in one place. That hasn't happened since Henry Ford days. And so if you want to be competitive, if you want to gain market share and sales around the world, it really has to be done regionally. And that's where Mexico fits in for the United States. Now, historically, the Republican Party has been a low-tariff party. That's the Democratic Party that's been the high-tariff party. Uh, and now we see a reversal, don't we, except uh, we still have a question about uh, the Trans-Pacific uh, Trade Pact. It's interesting when you watch the polls, right, we traditionally think of Republican Party as the free trade party, that the one that's pushed that. But if you look at polls of voters, today Democrats are more pro-trade and more pro-free trade than Republicans are. And that's in part due to demographics. Uh, Younger voters are more likely to vote Democrat than Republican. And it also has to do with the type of work um, that those people do. Democrats increasingly are better educated, are more likely to have a college education or above than Republicans are. And they're more likely to be in services industries or also to benefit from this opening to the world uh, rather than many of the those who would vote Republican. So we have seen a shift in public opinion towards trade between those who vote Democrat and those who vote Republican. Now, August 31, 2016, uh, Trump traveled to Mexico and met with the unpopular president, Pinheiro Neto. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you see anything that came out of that meeting? Well, the visit didn't make the president of Mexico any more popular. We can, we can say that because Mexicans feel very strongly that Trump, over the course of his campaign, denigrated them. 
He called them names, he called them rapists, he called them criminals, and felt that he really didn't show the respect for the nation, but also for their citizens, whether they live in Mexico or they live here in the United States. And this has a, been a growing population within the United States. Obviously, there's lots of migration from Mexico, though this has slowed since 2007. We've seen a decline. And actually, since 2009, there's been a net zero or net outflow of Mexicans coming to the United States. So today, when you look at our biggest immigrants coming in, biggest populations coming in, it's from India and China. It's not from Mexico. But still, we have a very large Mexican and Mexican-American population here. And so there were definitely feathers ruffled on both sides of the border. Following his visit, uh, the finance minister, uh, Luis Vedigare, one of uh, Pinheiro Neto's uh, longtime supporters, resigned from the government. Uh, do you have a backstory on that? <laughs> well, he is the one that orchestrated the visit um, by Trump. And given that it was, Mexicans don't always agree on a lot, but they did agree that there was a bad idea that he had come and that there was a consensus that it was the wrong decision. So in the wake of that uh, unhappiness by the large population, he did resign. Uh, so uh, do you see anything good that came out of the meeting other than you're fired? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure anything good came out of that meeting, um, but what I do see for the United States and Mexico going forward is that there are many avenues of cooperation. We've talked about the economic one, um, but a big one over the last decade plus has been a growing security cooperation between the two countries. Mexico is still struggling with very high levels of violence, particularly in, in areas around the country, along the border and the like. And the United States has had, uh, since the Bush administration, through the Obama administration, has had pretty close working cooperation on that. And that is something that will continue, hopefully, under the next president. And so whether that visit might have just been a bump in the road and hopefully won't affect this larger, much more important and much more stable area of U.S.-Mexico cooperation across myriad issues, because we share the border, we share an environment, we share people, we share the economy, we share security. There are a lot of issues that we share um, that the next president will, will need to work with Mexico on. Uh, let's shift to Brazil, which uh, we've cited in the past as an economic powerhouse. Uh, now we've had a nine-month uh, impeachment process, which has ended. Dilma Rousseff, the president, has been removed from office. Successor Tamer has been charged with corruption. Uh, not yet charged, but not, <laughs> but well, been not named. officially charged. But <laughs> certainly in the press. Yes. And uh, so, uh, what's going on there? It seems to be a center of political upheaval. Well, Temer now as the new president, the appointed president until 2018, when Brazil will hold elections again, faces a really difficult climate. And the first is, as you allude to, his legitimacy as president. He was not elected president. He was appointed after Dilma Rousseff was impeached. Um, and so he faces the difficulty of trying to push through big reforms to the economy, which are needed to get it up and running again, he, pushing through these big reforms when he really doesn't have the electoral mandate that he might have. And Brazil has been going through for the last two plus years a really extraordinary set of corruption investigations. And you have a set of prosecutors and judges um, that have been pushing what's been called the Lava Jato, the car wash scandal, because it began there, but really is a set of corruption investigations that have brought in Petrobras, which is the state-owned uh, energy company. It has brought in dozens and dozens of leading uh, corporate leaders. It's brought in dozens and dozens of members of Congress, of other political leaders. And in some of these investigations, even Temer himself, the president, has been named in some of the depositions. This has really rocked the political establishment and made it much more difficult to, to make deals, to push forward reforms. The other challenge Temer faces is that many of the things Brazil needs to do to jumpstart its economy, reform its tax code, reform its labor code, reform its social security system, many of these things, because of the way Brazil's constitution is, is written, are written into the constitution. So you need not just a majority to pass change, you need a three-fifths majority. So the political hurdles are so much higher to get change done, even as his political capital is much weaker than, say, perhaps if, um, an elected president would have been. Well, it's been said that all politics are local, and they do have uh, upcoming local elections, and it seems that candidates for the city council have been assassinated quite methodically. Uh, I mean, what's behind all that? They seem to be in total disarray. Yeah. 
There are challenges in Brazil. I mean, we talk about Mexico's security and, and the worries there, but Brazil, a per capita homicide rate, is equal to Mexico in some areas much worse. So this is a nation that, despite some advances, and I do think these corruption investigations are real advances in the justice system and its independence and its capacity, it still has real rule of law issues. And so some of these homicides, as well as these political assassinations, of which there have been some, are an example of that. How can you really establish a rule of law and public safety throughout the nation? Uh, now, they just had uh, the Olympics, which they hosted in Rio. There were still reports of uh, raw sewage in the bays and off the beaches, uh, threatening swimmers and sailors. Journalists reported that water in the diving pool morphed from robin's egg blue to <laughs> Shrek green. Uh, are you uh, critical of them for not running a better Olympics? You know, I actually think in the end the Olympics turned out turned out pretty well. Once everybody got there and showed up, everybody had a pretty good time, which is Brazil, it's a, it's a place where you can have a good time. And they're, especially Rio, where the Olympics were held, they're used to hosting big parties. Every year in February they host Carnival, um, their big celebration, and over a million people come. So the five to 600,000 who came for the Olympics to Rio, it's a different kind of event. You have to get to different venues and the like. Um, but I think overall they hosted it fairly well and dealt with some of the challenges. And those you point out are really about one of the longer term challenges of Brazil, which is infrastructure. And there they have not cleaned up those sewage systems. They've not built the roads, the railroads, the ports, the connections that would make that economy much, much more globally competitive. And that is the challenge for Temer and then whoever comes after him. Can you make these structural reforms, these political reforms, but can you really entice both local and foreign investment to Brazil to make it a much more, it could be an incredibly competitive global economy. It's one of the top 10 biggest economies in the world. There's over 200 million people there, potential consumers and consumers already. But how do you make it much more productive and much more competitive? That's the challenge for that country. So let's uh, move on to Colombia, where there's been some good news. Used to be thought of as uh, a failed state with uh, the narco terrorists in various provinces, and then there was the the revolutionary FARC challenging the government, but now the government's made a peace treaty with uh, FARC, and uh, I think Secretary of State Kerry went for the uh, signing of the peace treaty. So uh, what, what do you see happening there? I mean, this is a historic agreement. You had decades of war um, between the rebels, between the FARC and a few other smaller groups, and the government, and, and as you say, back in the 1990s, there were times when there was real worries that the state itself would fail. Uh, and so you have had the signing of the agreement and the beginning of this demobilization process by the FARC. And so while that's it's a huge step forward and one that should be celebrated, um, but that also there are longer term challenges, right? This is just we'll the talk start. about those. So one is you have 7000 fighters who are coming in out of the jungle uh, and you have to find a place for them. And many of them have never in their adult life known anything besides living in rebel encampments. They don't know much except how to use a, a gun. And so how do you integrate them into a legal economy? How do you find productive work for them to do and bring them back with family or with communities that they left many years ago? That's one challenge. The other challenge Colombia still needs to take on, and they have plans to do so, but, but whether they can fulfill them is always the question, is how do you address the reasons that led the FARC to rebel in the first place? And those are deep inequality, those are areas of the country that are still isolated from the larger country. So you need to go in, you need to build physical infrastructure, roads that connect these communities, railroads, airports, ports and the like, really to make sure that all of Colombia is connected so people who live in these areas aren't isolated. Um, but you also need to go and connect them in, in virtual ways too, right? The world has moved on from when the FARC first went out into the jungle to, to protest and to fight the government. How do you bring the majority of Colombians into the 21st century and provide them with legal opportunities, with a legal path forward? And that is something this government, the Santos government, will struggle with. Um, they have very low approval ratings despite this historic agreement. Um, and so this government and those that follow, how do you make Colombia much more prosperous and inclusive place. And what about uh, the drug trade? That remains uh, uh, in force, does it not, in Medellin and, and elsewhere? And that remains in force. And so the FARC were involved in the drug trade. They're not the only ones involved in the drug trade. There's other organizations there. 
But there is this big question about whether some of the FARC just stay and continue running the drug trade, or who else comes into that vacuum if those people leave. Um, because as we know, uh, demand has continued around the world in the United States, but also Europe and other places around the world for cocaine, Colombian cocaine. Uh, and so how does Colombia really insert rule of law more broadly to deal with that and other crimes that happen? How will they finance this, the new peace that's been arrived at? That's the big question, too. And Colombia, like many countries in South America, is very commodity dependent. Um, and so oil has been a big part of their budget. So as commodity prices have fallen, as oil prices have fallen, so too have the resources that they've had. So they are turning to the international community. They're turning to the United States, to Europe, to other places to help them in this process. They're turning to the private sector. They have a big infrastructure plan that they've been selling around the world, trying to get private sector investment to come in. But this is a challenge, right? It takes real money um, to integrate these people and, uh, and others who have been isolated, uh, and where are they going to get it? That's the issue. And let's move on to Mar Argentina, where there may be good news under the president, Mauricio Macri. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tell us about that. Well, another country that's out looking for money in, in the global markets, but has received a very warm embrace. Um, we had before him 12 years of the Kirchners, first Nestor Kirchner and Christina, his wife. Um, and they had a very protectionist view uh, of the economy. They had uh, economic populism as one of their, their platforms. So using patronage to build up their political base. Um, as we're seeing in allegations and court cases, they used not a, not a little corruption along the side. And so you've seen ministers there throwing bags of money over, over a convent wall, trying to hide the ill-gotten gains during, during his time in office. Um, so you've seen a real change away from uh, very divisive politics, a very anti-American stance in that country, and a very um, ec economic, unsustainable economic uh, model based on nationalism and populism, to a very pragmatic president who's come in a very open economically. He resolved challenges that were outstanding with foreign creditors um, that had been dodging Argentina for over a decade. Uh, he unified the currency. He's made a lot of changes to really open up the economy and make it more open and competitive internationally. Um, but to do so, he has to deal with a recession, he has to deal with very high inflation, and he needs money to help bridge the gap um, until he can get the finances uh, in line. And so far, he's been very successful in that. He has um, the support of the international community, of, of many investors who are looking for decent returns in this era of low interest rates. Um, and he so far has pretty good support at home, even though some of these measures have been pretty hard on the middle and lower classes. So, so far so good, but he needs to show results before people get weary of high unemployment, high inflation, and other economic difficulties. But Juan Perón, he's not. He is not. In fact, he is the opposite. He's much more uh, of a technocrat, one might say. He's a businessman in training. He was mayor of the city of Buenos Aires, one of the biggest um, populations in, in the country. So he's had some governing experience. Um, but he comes in with a much more pragmatic, moderate, um, and market-friendly view. And his team is very much that, too. Many trained in the United States as well as in Argentina, um, but very open to international markets. Venezuela? is not like that. Not like that. <laughs> so Venezuela, as we've seen uh, the change in commodity prices, the collapse of oil prices, uh, has rather than turning to a more moderate path, a more open political path, has turned in the other direction. Um, so we've seen increasingly authoritarian moves by Maduro, the current president of Venezuela. We have seen uh, increasing control of the economy, expropriations of businesses, um, controlling even just the sale of basic food and medicine. Uh, and part of these increasing interventions over now 15 plus years, first by Chavez, then by Maduro, we're seeing the local economy disintegrate. And Do you detect a difference between Chavez and Maduro, or is Maduro just uh, Chavez prime? You know, he is different in character. He doesn't have the charisma and, and that, that Chavez the did. Chavez light. Chavez light, exactly. <laughs> and he is dealing with the aftermath. Chavez went out when oil prices were quite high. He still had a lot of money and support um, and the ability to spread patronage and largesse throughout society. And now Maduro is dealing with low oil prices. He's dealing with falling production of even the oil. They can't produce what they did. When Chavez came in, they were producing 3.5 million barrels. Today, they're producing just over 2 million barrels. But OPEC just uh, said they were going to curtail production. Is that good news for Venezuela? Well, for Venezuela, they just can't produce. And in part because they had a very strong state-owned enterprise, PDVSA, which was very technocratic, um, but it has been politicized and weakened over the last 15 years. 
And so it has become a place of patronage rather than a place of production. And so if OPEC cuts production, that's fine with Venezuela because they just can't produce the amount that they were before. Their production will fall no matter what OPEC does because of their inability to produce. And that is hard for Venezuela because government finances and all the things they do since the government controls the economy depend on oil revenues, which is falling. So I have a question for you, Shannon O'Neill, because we've come to the end of our time. Uh, with the new administration in office, uh, do you have an optimistic view of uh, our future relations with Latin America? I believe actually Latin America in general, with some exceptions like Venezuela, is moving in a very positive direction. It's much more democratic than it was many years ago. Uh, it's finding ways to diversify its economy. It's a much more pragmatic and open path. So I do think this is a region, when we look around the world and the challenges the United States is going to is going to face going forward. This is a region um, that has mostly good news. Um, and it's also one that we can work with many of these countries as we face bigger global problems, whether they're finance, climate change, or other things. We can work with Latin mostly America. Mostly good news. Shannon O'Neill, thank you so much for coming by. This has been marvelous. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations in the digital age. I'm Jim Zirin. All the best.